Excellent. We'll go ahead and get started. I still see some people trickling in, um, but we'll let them uh, come in as the presentation makes way. So we have here to kick off this session number four, Innovations in Dust Control and Cleaning, Jordan Newton, Chief Operating Officer and Integrator at Sonic Air. Jordan has over 17 years experience in fire science. He's held several roles, such as forensic engineer, investigating fires and explosions. He's worked at Underwriters Laboratory, certifying firefighter equipment and PPE. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from North Carolina State University, an MBA from Letournau University, and I may need to get Jordan to, to give me a, a, a pronunciation on that, and he is a licensed professional engineer. In the presentation today, we're kicking off this dust control session on the use of sonic air dust control fans to automate combustible dust safety. So Jordan, without further ado, we'll give the floor over to you for your presentation. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's Letourneau, close enough. Uh, so all good. All right. Thanks for being with me here today. So before we get rolling too far, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey and I want to introduce you to my family because in, in order to, to kind of know me, you kind of need to know what's important to me. And so this is my son, Bradley, standing next to me here. Bradley is just turned 14, but he's already like 6'1", 6'2". The picture doesn't do him justice there. He's all things baseball. My daughter in the middle, Lila, she's 12. She plays volleyball. And my daughter on the right there is Raleigh. Raleigh is 10, and she is all things unicorns and pixie dust. And you may not know this, and I don't know the exact KST value, but I think pixie dust is probably combustible. Uh, and then over beside her is my wife, Meredith. Uh, we've been in, married for almost 18 years and she keeps all the plates spinning for sure. So this picture, it was taken the day after Thanksgiving and it's been our tradition for many years now within a day or two after Thanksgiving, we visit the North Carolina mountains and we go pick out a Christmas tree. It's kind of the Christmas tree capital of the world. And we just make a day out of it and we have a fun trip. But as Chris mentioned earlier, I have a background in safety. And in my previous role, I did test and certify firefighting equipment. And prior to that was in forensic engineering. So in that job, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was very exciting, but it also put me in front of some serious tragedies and I had to see some gruesome things as well. And so we covered everything from workplace injuries and fatalities to car crashes and house fires, uh, plane crashes, train crashes, you name it. But we dealt with the worst of the worst. And so unfortunately now, wherever I go, my mind kind of plays out all these potentially bad outcomes that could possibly happen and take place. And so I guess I'm a little more safety conscientious and safety aware, but I can also be an anxious mess about this stuff at times too. So for example, when I'm driving down the road and I see a truckload of pipe, I'm worried if the chain's going to break or what if the truck swerves or what about that person in the oncoming lane, they appear to be on their phone. Oh no, uh, you get the point, but unfortunately that's just where my mind goes. So when we go to the Christmas tree farm each year, I am still on the lookout for my family safety. And don't worry, no kids were harmed in the making of this illustration. We've probably all been to those seminars and, and safety sessions where someone's had a, a bad injury or had someone die fatally in a workplace accident. And those are very powerful, but that's not how the story ends today. That's not where we're going. So when we get um, to the Christmas tree lot, uh, I, I'm looking out for huge tractors. There's huge tractors giving hay rides, taking people from the parking lot up the hill to where the trees are. And those tractors, I've been on large equipment like that. It has a lot of blind spots and you've got a lot of kids that are all hopped up and excited about Christmas. And they're also hopped up on hot chocolate and they're running around everywhere. So I'm worried about visibility for the tractor drivers and what they can see. And this is a real working farm. It's a workplace for these people. There's a lot going on. There's guys with chainsaws ready to cut down that favorite tree at a moment's notice. And I'm keeping an eye out for them and the falling Christmas trees on the side of the hill. I'm also on the lookout for the drivers, just the other cars in the parking lot area. They're in line to pick up their Christmas trees. And when traffic slows, what do most of us do as drivers? I do it. We, we all do it. We grab that cell phone. We start deleting email or looking at social media 
And it, it really only takes one slip of the foot off the brake for, you know, a pedestrian to get injured. So now you have my list of hazards to look out for when you go shopping for that perfect Christmas tree. We'll come back to that a little bit more in a minute. But what are some of the more obvious safety hazards you look for in the workplace? When you think about the safety of your coworkers or coming home, being reunited to your family and loved ones at the end of the day, what concerns come to your mind about your facility? What does your organization put a safety emphasis on and what are the, the safety bulletins that you regularly see? What do they typically cover? Well, there's probably confined spaces. Chris is telling me it's ergonomics is a big deal right now. Fall issues probably come to mind like ladders and scaffolding and, and even fall protection devices, forklifts. There's eye protection to worry about and all things PPE, pinch points on equipment, hot work, fire mitigation, lockout, tag out, electrical hazards, heat exhaustion, respiratory protection. There's so much to think about. And so in an industrial facility like the ones many of us work in, it's hard to wrap our minds around all of those potential hazards that exist and how we can work to address them all. So we have to prioritize these hazards in order to determine where to devote our time, our money, and our resources. So how do you quantify a hazard? Now that you've identified the hazards, how do you quantify them? The li likely uh, hood of the occurrence, are you looking at how probable the occurrence is or the severe severity of the occurrence should it occur are you thinking about the loss of work hours the level of the injury would there be loss of life or loss of structure does it come down to dollars at stake unfortunately a lot of time dollars are the deciding factor and maybe you're familiar with a risk assessment matrix where you weight the severity of a potential outcome versus the likelihood of the occurrence but regardless of what tool you, you are using, or maybe you don't use a tool at all, but your organization is putting different weights on each risk based on where you're spending your time, your money, and your resources. So let's go back to the Christmas tree farm for a minute. This is my wife's car. We drove it that day. And as we pulled into the tree lot, they told us uh, where to park. And of course, being the North Carolina mountains, it was on a little bit of an incline. And as I exited the door, I was holding the door back, trying to make sure it didn't slam shut. And as the door clicked shut, I realized I had forgotten one thing. I'd left one thing in the car. And unfortunately, it wasn't my keys. I wish it had been my keys. That would have been a lot easier. It was, it was actually my thumb. I had left my thumb in the door and I had to actually reach back with my free hand and open the door to free my thumb. Um, you know, I, it hurt a lot. It turned black and blue and it still looks a little funny, uh, this, this long after the event, but you see, I was on the lookout for all those big safety issues, kind of the things that get all of my attention, the things that are staring me in the face, but I, I forgot about this kind of hidden safety issue. I missed one. And let me tell you, those doors are heavy and they are not forgiven. On May 31st, 2017, the workers at Didion Milling Facility in Cambria, Wisconsin, were focused on all of the normal safety things that we mentioned and talked about earlier when the unthinkable happened. They suffered a combustible dust explosion and employees later stated that the dust had been released over time in several different ways through leaking equipment, leaking pipes, open, opening the equipment up for maintenance and product spilling from broken packaging as well. And while cleaning was done daily, some employees said that the plant was dusty while others said it was clean. And some even described it as spick and span. Some stated that they were covered in dust every day. Different experiences from different viewpoints. And this only goes to highlight the reason for involving as many different people with as many different viewpoints as possible when you're conducting your DHA different perspectives and different experiences really matter. And by the way, I don't mention this incident to invoke fear, but really to just continue to raise awareness of some of the hidden dangers that we face daily. 
Okay, so we've talked about some of the potential safety issues and the safety aspects of things, but what are the general day-to-day -day challenges that are going through your mind when you think about driving up to your facility on a, a daily basis? What keeps you up at night or what gives you that kind of aching feeling in the pit of your stomach on Sunday night thinking about Monday morning? What obstacles are you going to need to overcome in 2023 to achieve your corporate goals? Hey, if it were easy, anyone could do it, but that's why you're the expert and you're in your position. So what challenges do you have ahead of you? If you're a plant manager, it may be keeping the equipment operational or the installation of a new equipment project. If you work in safety, maybe it's getting the funding you need in order to implement a new initiative. Maybe you're concerned about supply chain and the availability of raw materials. Or it could be that it's just sales volume and business in general that you're concerned about. But I'm guessing that no matter what your job responsibilities are, labor is probably somewhere in your list of challenges for this year. The Society of Human Resource Management, or SHRM, as you've probably heard them called, published an article in January titled Labor Shortages Forecast to Persist for Years. And so I want to share with you a few quotes. Unfortunately, they're not good ones. It's not good news. And I hope you weren't expecting a motivational speech from me today because it's, it's not pretty. But uh, we'll start with this one. Demographic shifts and aging populations mean countries like the U.S. will experience an ongoing shortage of workers and hiring will remain challenging for years. These countries simply won't have enough workers to fill long-term demand for years to come. Over the next decade, the number of people of working age, so they define that as ages 15 to 65, the number of people working age will decline in the US by over 3%. And that trend will continue beyond 10 years. And it's a fundamental error to think that as COVID-19 recedes, hiring difficulties will evaporate. Since 1990, the global labor force participation rate has fallen steadily from over 65% of working people age to less than 60%. There are simply not enough people in the available talent pool. The labor force is at least 2 million people below where we had expected to be by now without the pandemic happening. So let's Think about that for a minute. That's a big number. So they're saying that if the pandemic hadn't have happened, we would have another 2 million people available in the workforce uh, right now is at least what they were projecting. Quits, talking about the number of people quitting their job. Quits will remain above average through much of this year, but start to normalize as well. Wages will also stay high and wage growth has slowed down, but is still very strong. The higher number of quits drives wages up, kind of that supply demand thing that we're familiar with. Whether a recession is officially declared or not, declining labor productivity has become a worldwide challenge. So it's not good news. As I said before, you get the point. Here's, here's my takeaway from this article. People are continuing to quit their jobs. When someone does quit, it will be very hard to find their replacement. If and only if you do find their replacement, this new employee will cost more than the one that left. And this new employee will probably be less efficient at doing what the previous employee did. So get ready to pay more for doing less when it comes to manual labor. Now, when we're short on labor, one of the first things that probably gets neglected is housekeeping. This is true at my house and I've seen it in the workplace as well. And what we see here in front of us, we can all probably quickly identify as fugitive dust. And no matter what industry you're working in, if dust is a part of the process, there's always gonna be fugitive dust. The dust that escapes the process and just goes where it wants to go. Once the dust escapes your process, it's then free to roam and it often rides on thermal currents and ends up on overhead structures. And this is typically, Chris and I've talked about this before, this is generally the finest and dust and the smallest particle size. And it's also the driest dust and it dries out, continues to dry out over time generally. This means it's probably some of the most combustible dust in your facility. 
once it gets to the overhead space and starts to accumulate, there's really only two ways to address it and get it down. The first is what I believe is really the riskiest of the two, and that's a blowdown. While this is permitted by NFPA 652, blowdowns really add that fourth element to the explosion pentagon, and that's the, the suspension or the entrainment of the dust in the air, making it airborne because we've already got the oxygen, we've already got a building enclosure, we've got the dust as the fuel, the only element that we're now missing is the ignition. And I wish we could say that blowdowns were a thing of the past, but I know that the reality is that some facilities are still doing blowdowns daily. So please, please, please consult with NFPA 652 and use a very high level of caution regarding your ignition sources if you are still conducting blowdowns. So the next method for removing accumulated dust in overhead spaces is vacuuming. And then again, please don't go to the hardware store and purchase a generic shop vac for this. If you are going to rely on a vacuum process for maintaining your overhead spaces, then please invest in a vacuum that's rated for class two environments. And really, if you're dealing with any combustible dust, no matter where it is in your facility, use a rated certified class two vacuum cleaner. Uh, there are some good options out there for this. Just know that you will also need staff to do this, which brings us back to uh, the issue with the lack of employees and labor that we defined earlier. So if blowdowns are potentially dangerous and vacuuming is laborious, then what's the alternative? Can we automate at least a portion of dust safety? Well, the 2019 edition of NFPA 652 and also in the proposed edition of NFPA 660 has a section on fans for continuous dust control. Section 9.6.3 states, it shall be permitted to install and use fans to limit dust accumulation in elevated areas that are otherwise difficult to reach for housekeeping. And it then goes on to lay out exactly how fans of this type can be implemented and utilized in conjunction with an overall housekeeping strategy. So the standard also goes on to say that fans shall be appropriate for the electrical classification in the areas where they are used. Now, believe it or not, in many industries that deal with dust, the ceilings and overhead spaces are actually not classified areas. They're not classified as hazardous locations. Um, and, and I, do, I don't want to go off on a tangent here about how these areas get classified and who's responsible for that, but I do want to highlight if that you are looking at implementing a system of fans for continuous dust control, please ensure that your equipment meets any area classifications that you have in place at your facility. And Chris talked earlier about innovation, and that's really what Sonic Air's done in this area. So we've been around almost 20 years, but you may not have ever heard of us, but even so with these requirements for hazardous location certification, that's where we're innovating and moving forward with. We are class two, division two certified, and we are hopefully just a week or two away from wrapping up our division one certification as well. Okay. So how do these fans actually work? What's the technology behind a fan for continuous dust control? I thought I would show this video because it does a better job of explaining how these fans actually work through illustrations and videos than I can actually do at this point in the presentation. So uh, take a look. Here at Sonic Air, we're frequently asked, don't your fans just blow the dust around? Or maybe you picture Sonic Air fans continuously kicking up dust in your facility, making you pull out those masks that you thought you were done with. Well, today on You Ask, We Answer, we're gonna show you how Sonic Air fans do not kick up dust, but they actually keep the air in your facility cleaner and clearer than ever before. I'm Jordan with Sonic Air, and this is You Ask, We Answer. And if you find the following information helpful, don't forget to like it below, give us a thumbs up, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on LinkedIn. Well, if this is the first time you've ever seen a Sonic Air dust control fan, the thought of a fan plus dust may make you wonder, wouldn't a fan just continuously blow the dust around in my facility? Or you may be thinking, aren't these things just blowdown fans that I can turn on whenever the dust builds up? Well, maybe you're also concerned about the effects on air quality. Well, in the next few minutes, I'll show you what barrier air means 
and how it'll make you the hero at your facility when it comes to maintaining a clean environment and cleaner air, all while saving you money. Well, perhaps you've used cooling fans in the past in your facility. Well, those fans definitely have the potential to stir up dust particles and actually create a more dangerous condition for your employees. Sonic Air fans actually operate in a completely different way. Some call it science, some call it magic, we call it barrier air. And here's how it works. First, it disrupts the thermal air currents that carry dust to your hard to reach overhead spaces. Second, it uses something called agglomeration, and we'll come back to this one in just a minute. But lastly, there's a continuous sweep done by the fans, and since the fans are designed to operate continuously, it's unlikely that any particles will ever reach the ceiling due to points number one and two. However, should any particles reach the ceiling, the fans will clean those particles off on the next pass by. Back to that weird word agglomerate. Okay, so what it means is actually to gather in a collection or a mass or collection of things. So stay with me here. When you look at dust particles under a microscope, they're usually not smooth. They're actually kind of hairy and fibrous. And this shape and structure can cause the particles to actually cling together when they're disturbed by a, a big blast of air from the fan. It makes them bump into each other and they stick together kind of like tiny little balls of Velcro. And therefore they continuously get bigger and bigger. And eventually they get to such a large size, they can't ride on the thermal currents and the air currents anymore. And they actually get so big and heavy that they fall to the floor where they can be easily accessed by your plant staff. One of the other added benefits you'll experience with sonic air fans besides clean, cobweb, and dust-free overhead spaces is better air quality. Oftentimes in a manufacturing environment, there'll be small particulate floating in the air. You might even see halos around the lights in the facility. Or you might feel like you have dust on your hair and on your clothes, even though you're already using other dust control methods like a dust collection system. Our fans make the dust particles stick together, making them too heavy to float in the air. And consequently, you'll experience cleaner, clearer air in your facility, which can often lead to less sick time, greater employee satisfaction, lower health costs, and minimized employee turnover. So if you'd like to learn more about agglomeration, barrier air, or how a dust control fan system could work in conjunction with your existing dust mitigation efforts, visit our website. There you'll find a case study that shows how we measurably reduce the particle content in the air for the ASIC company. Or check out this short video below about their experience. Hey, we'd love to hear from you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if you have an idea for one of our videos, please let us know by leaving feedback on our YouTube channel or in the comments below or on our LinkedIn page. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on You Ask, We Answer. Okay, uh, a little bit cheesy, but with big words like agglomerate, that guy's got to know what he's talking about, right? Okay, so barrier air, like we just saw in the video, the fans are not intended to be blowdown fans, but really to control that ambient air and ensure that the dust falls quickly back to the floor. Again, NFPA 652 states that fans shall be in operation whenever the equipment generating dust is in operation, and that's where the continuous part of the dust control fans really comes into play. So here we see an elevation view of fans installed over a process. And you can see the zones of coverage that will be created as the fans oscillate up and down as well as rotate continually 360 degrees over top of the process. So does it work? Well, here's a before and after of the fans uh, being installed and you can see how effective they were and really the photo on the right shows the current state of things and how things are continuously maintained with ever, without ever having a gap in cleaning coverage. So when we talk about barrier air technology, we're generally talking about a horizontal process in a single story space. However, we've also had great success implementing fans in vertical applications as well. And we call this dynamic particle control. With dynamic particle control, we're using really the uppermost fan, in this instance, fan number eight in the diagram to ensure that the dust is kept at a level where the fan below it, fan number seven, can reach the dust. And fan number seven then continues to ensure that this dust is pushed down to a solid floor where it can be collected and swept up. 
fan number six is mounted below that solid floor and works in conjunction with all of the fans below it where they can continuously again keep pushing the dust down through any graded mezzanine floors or anything like that to ensure the dust also finds its way down to the next solid floor at the bottom of the tower. So what is what is the effectiveness of that look like? Well, here's a before picture. As you can see, and this is a multi-level facility, and this is the kind of normal status there. This is a normal operating condition for this facility before the installation of a fan system. And this is the after. So this is the way things are continuously now without ever having to do any manual type of cleaning. So no matter what type of facility you have, whether it's a flat storage or a loading facility like the one we see on the left or just a plant with a lot of hard to reach spaces like the one on the right, if you deal with dust, you have fugitive dust. And we all know that fugitive dust can be challenging to maintain. You and I know that, as does OSHA. As we were reminded yesterday during the closing session, OSHA has reissued their national emphasis program this year. And right on the first page in the executive summary, it states that the following revisions are intended to provide guidance for targeting and performing combustible dust inspections. And we heard that word really used multiple times yesterday. They talked about targeting. And this is a, so combustible dust is, is a safety issue. And these inspectors will be well-versed in all the hazards associated with it. So let's work together to minimize and even eliminate overhead dust accumulation. Make sure all that dust ends up at floor level where it's much easier to collect and maintain when you can access it. A large portion of your fugitive dust ends up there anyway, so let's make sure it all gets there so it's safer and easier to access. So can you automate dust safety? When I think back to my thumb in the car example, could I address that hazard in a way that makes sure it never happens again? Possibly, somebody mentioned training in the chats, maybe. Uh, I, I was also thinking I could wear some huge giant steel thimbles on my thumbs to protect them from that big pinch point. Uh, take the PPE approach, thumbs up. Uh, I could also remove the doors from my car. I could remove the hazard, but then again, I might have a kid fall out as I drive down the road. Uh, or I could hire someone to ride along with me and my family and ensure that the doors are always safely closed and the area is clear before they're closed so that no one ever gets a finger smashed again. But a manual labor route seems very, very expensive. Now, if someone made a soft close device or slow close like you may have seen on a kitchen cabinet that I could affordably retrofit to my vehicle, then that would sound very enticing. And we're basically talking about the same thing here with dust control fans. And hopefully by now, through the examples we've looked at, as well as the verbiage we've covered from NFPA, that you'll agree with me that we can automate at least a portion of our dust safety. So let's stop manually cleaning overhead spaces. This technology has worked for many others. It can work for you too. And I've got just kind of three key takeaways from today. So number one, don't forget pixie dust is combustible. So watch out for that. Number two, agglomeration is a real thing. It's the word of the day. So use it for your benefit in dust control. And yes, you can automate a portion of your dust safety. So we are gonna be at the powder and bulk solid show coming up next month in Chicago and can't wait to be there. I know Chris is gonna be there as well. We'll be in booth 1036. If you uh, are gonna be there, come see us. If not, uh, scan the QR code or go to sonicare.com to check us out and find out more information about this technology and what's going on with fugitive dust. Excellent. Thanks, Jordan, for a great presentation. I hope your thumb healed up. All right. We were it's guessing in the there. chat about close. Uh, the hierarchy of safety controls and how it could be applied to such <laughs> right. a... uh, No, it's good. We have lots of lots of questions coming. Let me just see time-wise. Okay, yep, we got about 10 minutes. So that'll be good. Um, there is one question about manufacturer's input. If you could restate that, because I'm not quite sure what you're trying to ask there, or if the second question, which is the one I'm going to read, answers that, then that's fine. Um, I'll ditch that question and restate it if you want. So the, okay. the question we'll cover is, 
What are some of the major mistakes clients might make when they're installing these sort of fans? Any horror stories or even innocent things that people might do that just are going to degrade the performance? Mm, uh, cleaning, maintenance. Uh, there's minimal maintenance, There's, uh, but the, the number one maintenance is if you have a very sticky dust, we see this a lot in wood dust, particularly uh, fiber boards and things like that where there's a resin applied, is not maintaining the fan and going up every you know six months or so and scraping the residue and the adhesives and the resins off of the fan shroud and it will eventually build up so bad that it um, stops the fan blade from spinning so it is a polymer blade it's not a metal on metal kind of contact thing but it, it's an issue um, also want to be careful there we have heard of issues where people work on an elevated mezzanine as like immediately adjacent to a fan and uh, do worry about dust particulate um, being potentially disturbed in that area and becoming an eye hazard but in general in an overhead space it's it's a non-issue okay perfect any experience with metal dust i'm not sure the question is specifically about agglomeration um, but yeah, mm -hmm. any experience of metal dust and, and how the system might work with it? Uh, some, some, we've done some work in some shipyards where uh, there's a lot of uh, body fillers and metals and groundings and things like that. A lot of success there, a lot of success with um, foundries because they often get into uh, recycling. And so there's a lot of paint and ash and uh, just general trash in the recycled metals that come in. Um, so we're uh, working a lot in those industries as well. And I would say, because I think the, the person who's asking was was pointing to agglomeration if that, that mechanism might be impacted. Um, the kind of interlinking that you saw in the, the fluffy fibrous particles and, and the, the exceptional animation, Jordan, um, that's not the only way agglomeration happens. There's Van der Waals forces and a bunch of other ways. So metal particles actually do agglomerate, even though if they're even if they have smooth surfaces. And I think the point of the fans is they cause the particles to bump together and agglomerate with whatever mechanism is happening. Um, we had two, at least two questions about exposure. So let me scroll down to the bottom. Yeah, have you done any measurement on, so one's, do you know how respir res uh, respirals, which I'm not sure if that's a word, at floor level might be affected. And then there's another one on have you tested worker exposure to dust before and after the fan implementation ah, implementation of your fan systems. Is that sort of testing you've done and, and report on before, Jordan? We have, and there's a study on our website. They can You can reach out to me or you can go find it on our website. We did that with the ASIC company. We did some uh, air particle monitoring before and after fan installation. And we've got several stories and instances of customers who, as the, the video kind of pointed out, it, it kind of does help clear the air and have pointed out how they were required to wear respirators before using the fans. And then once the fans were installed, the air just got a lot cleaner and clearer, and they've been able to not have to wear respirators any longer. Yeah, I think that's an added benefit, right? I mean, it's it's both mm -hmm. the, the, the air mm -hmm. respiratory not having the halos over your lights, not tasting, what did Diane say in her presentation yesterday? Not tasting the tapioca starch in the air. Oh, um, wow. that, yeah. That's that's good. And then obviously the combustible dust, making sure that material's not collecting up on rafters is really important as well. We have a question about truck loading and unloading areas, which are adjacent to large roll doors. Um, is this somewhere where you've had success installing the, the dust control fans? And if the door is opening and closing, is that gonna interfere with the the air barrier that's created? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, we have done it. Uh, it. Does it interfere with the, the fans? Generally not, because the fans constantly moving and constantly rotating. We can also interlock the fans with a system so that when you are actually doing the dumping process, that you're not going to blow by the spout or something like that. And, and there's two different ways we can do that and make sure we're not disturbing the material flow. Uh, but then the, the fans are turned on immediately after to ensure that dust kind of goes back to the floor. Got it. Um, and we did have clarification from the, the question I asked about, and specifically the, the individual's consultant, they're saying that they have had clients purchase fans and try to install them themselves. Um, and then the question is to you, is, is that a good idea? And have you seen any common 
pitfalls of people trying to install it themselves and, and not having that done right. Yeah, that's uh, it's funny you, you bring that up. In the last, uh, I would say, two years, we've worked extensively hard to set up a network of certified installers across at, at least uh, the continental U.S. and are working out from there. But we have we do see a lot of issues. Um, our team, our engineering team, designs the system and the layout. And historically, we've just been an equipment provider. But we do now see the really the the customer gets a better system and a better outcome if they let us just take care of everything and we guarantee everything uh, out of the chute. We do additional warranty if we get to install it. You get an extra year warranty, and also we have something that we now call our compliance guarantee where we guarantee that you'll be in compliance with the NFBA regulations if you let us do all that. And so it's, it's really a, a great outcome for the customer. Perfect. And we had some questions here about starting up. Um, are there any best practices? I can imagine if you just, if you have a really dusty facility and you put the fans up and turn it on, then that dust is going to come down all pretty rapidly. Um, yeah. That's probably another reason to bring you in to do the, the, uh, the installation, the, the turning on of the system. Yeah, any best practices that people should be aware of for, for getting started with these? Sure. So, you know, in general, the, the goal of everything here would be to minimize a dust cloud, right? That's that's the end goal is to minimize uh, the dust cloud and the potential for the ignition of that dust cloud. So we do recommend pre-clean as much as reasonable. You will never get everything. Once you turn the fans on, the fans are going to find pockets of dust that, that manual cleaning just can't get to. If you're going to do a blowdown method anyway, and you have everything in your area classified and you've monitored all your ignition sources, you may be able to start the fans up incrementally, uh, very slowly so that you're not creating that huge cloud of dust all at once. I do not recommend putting the fans in, no pre-cleaning and flipping the switch. That's a bad idea. Please don't do that. But there are ways to, like I said, slowly start the fans up to just minimize the amount of dust in the atmosphere. Yeah, I'm sure one of the key things that a lot of companies would be looking at is to avoid sort of shutdown time. So doing that incremental right. approach is, is right. the probably the solution to to addressing that. Uh, Betsy did put in the chat to everyone, uh, Betsy McKenna, who's um, also a Sonic Air, put in the chat to one of the case studies, which I encourage people to click on there as well. Um, we got a whack of questions, Jordan, but we only got one more minute. <laughs> so right. let, me, let me pick one. Um, this is probably a good one. Uh, well, they're all good ones, but I got to pick one and, and we'll go with it. So is there a minimum size room or space that works for Sonic Air systems? Can it be used in small packaging room, for example? So yeah, some comments on different sizes and options, minimum sizes, maximum sizes, and then we'll I'll encourage everyone else to reach out to you um, for, for separate comments. Sure. So we have compact fans that are you know roughly 36 inches in height, and we have a large standard fan that's about 48 inches in height, they range from one horsepower to two horsepower. And, you know, again, it kind of depends on your ceiling height. Length and width of the room really doesn't matter. Uh, and we can also put the fans on variable speed drives to slow them down if they're producing too much velocity. Um, you know, it, it's a case by case basis, but I'd say if you have dust, if you have probably at least a, a nine or 10 foot ceiling, um, and we've even worked in shorter spaces on mezzanines. We just use guard kits and things like that. But um, there, there's a good chance that a fan, if you're having to do overhead cleaning and you've got, you know, at least, like I said, a nine or 10 foot ceiling, there's a very good chance that a fan could be beneficial for you. Yeah, and I really like seeing the other uses too, like the towers and knocking that dust mm -hmm. from the top down. And, and I think that's mm -hmm. some innovative things in the space as well. Um, I'll, so I just put in a link to Jordan's presentation page in the Dust Save Academy. It's got his email right there. If you scroll down, jtnewton at sonicair.com. We do have questions around, um, yeah, maintenance, uh, make sure systems don't get impaired, um, certification, interlocking, which you can get to, which is a good one, um, yeah. comparing between the cost of ownership of a dust collection system and Sonic Air fans, all very great questions. I'd recommend cleaning frequency just came up. <laughs> I'd recommend shoot um, Jordan as many emails as you possibly can, and he'll get your questions answered from there. We will end this presentation for now, and I'll say thank you, Jordan, for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thank you all for attending. It was a pleasure. Great. So we'll be back here in just a few minutes' time to continue to talk about a high-level 
combustible dust, and we'll do that with Bill Prince uh, of Spaceback International and Frank Cruz of Spaceback USA as well. So we'll see you back here in a few minutes.